Hey everybody, this is Zachary Jeans. Let's keep walking through this Bible. So today is day 336, and we are working our way through Genesis. We're going to be in uh, Genesis chapter 8 through 11 today, and we are reading through the Old Testament over the course of a whole year. Mm, roughly, give or take, 11 months. So thank you for joining me. Thanks for uh, taking time to get in the Word every day, and uh, I hope you grow as a result of it um thank you for the likes the love thank you for subscribing over on youtube or wherever you are uh thanks for sharing when you share people get a c um and i appreciate that so all the normal stuff um for those who support me god bless you i appreciate it uh you can do so if you like to everything's free but if you want to support what i'm doing and see me do more of it um, I appreciate that. And you can do so at ko-fi.com backslash Zachary Jeans. So super simple. It's like coffee with a K dot com Zachary Jeans. A ah, little coffee. All right. So we are in Genesis chapter eight and we're picking up where the flood subsides. Noah, Noah just got out of the ark and uh or is about to get out of the ark and you know all the rain and cataclysmic stuff has happened and uh we'll pick it up in verse one of chapter eight but god remembered noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark god made a wind blow over the earth and the water subsided the fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed the rain of the heavens was restrained and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark. And he, that he had made, and sent forth a raven. So he let loose a bird. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him, to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand, and he took... <clears throat> and he took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days. And again, he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening. And behold, in her mouth was a freshly picked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove. And she did not return to him anymore. In the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. And Noah removed the co covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, go out from the ark you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing and every bird Everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. Now, this is pretty amazing because we get a lot of numbers and time frames for how long Noah was on the ark. And I did not add this up myself. I didn't add it up, uh, at least for this sermon. I, I've, I think I've looked at this in the past. But I was reading a commentary which did all the math and I kind of followed along. It's like, wow, that's amazing. So it even taking into account the lunar year that the Jewish people keep, right? 
and the amount of months that they have and how they count it and how they have an extra month and this and that. Um, essentially, this comes out to roughly, almost exactly, depending on how you add it up, uh, one solar year. From the time that Noah went onto the ark to the time where God told him to go, go ahead and get on out. And so he was, even though we, we teach the Sunday school version, well, it rained 40 days and 40 nights, you know, and oh, that was such a long time. And, and it's like, no, actually, it was much longer than that. It was a full year from the time which they set foot onto the ark. God closed it up to the time where God told him to come on out, right? Uh, another interesting point I, I enjoyed from a commentary I was reading, uh, uh, the Wesleyan commentary. Uh, it just noted that Noah waited to hear from the Lord when to come out of the ark. The Lord told him to go on into the ark, and he waited for the Lord's word. He didn't take some sort of presumptuous action. He really waited on the Lord to act. And, uh, and it's a subtle thing, you know, um, but I think it's important for all of us, right? Are we waiting on the Lord? Sometimes we're like, oh, we should just act. God shows us, uh, it seems for, the Bible says in places, um, it seemed good for them to do. And they did it, the apostles, right? Um, Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts, right, walked around with Paul. Luke says that, you know, it seemed good for him to lay out an account, right, of everything that Jesus said and did. And then, of course, ensuing the, the the story of Acts of the Apostles. So there are times where just general wisdom, godly wisdom tells us to do stuff and we do it. Um, and then there's that part where it's like, well, wait a minute, just because it seems good to do, should I do it? And um, I don't think it's wrong to, to ever do right. It's always right to do right. But God won't fault you for waiting on him and waiting for his guidance and his direction. And Noah did. Noah waited. Um, then Noah built, when he came out of the ark, then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings to the altar. Now, mind you, they had seven pairs of the clean animals, remember? Uh, we always see the, uh, the, you know, Sunday school version of two by two, they entered the ark. And that's true. Uh, but we get further detail that there were actually seven pairs of clean animals. <clears throat> and to that end, even though we haven't had a description of what a clean animal is yet, this is within the Mosaic Law, uh, the five books, the Pentateuch. And, uh, and he's writing to readers who have been told in his writings what a clean animal is. Okay. And it's also noted that at the time of Noah, in pre-flood times, they knew what a clean animal was and what an unclean animal was. So Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, Never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart was evil from his youth or is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. So God promises that as far as his wrath is concerned, his judgment of the earth, he understands, first of all, that the man's heart is sinful. It just is. Not that he didn't know, but like it's proved out in reality, right? And he promises that his judgment will never be a flooding of the entire earth again. Now, there will be great judgments. Uh, but even in the largest judgments of the book of Revelation, of the apocalypse, the end time, uh, you don't see an entire wiping out of humanity. You do see thirds of the earth killed. And decimated, which is very large, but you don't see the entirety of the earth. And, and so even in his greatest judgments on earth, 
against a sinful, rebellious man. It is with an eye towards, hey, realize you're small and you are sinful and you are being judged and you need God's grace and God's in control. He has the right to judge you and you can plead for his grace and his mercy. Um, that's the point of Revelation. But he doesn't wipe out the entire earth does say that had the judgments continued, no one would have survived. But even there in the end, God does stay his hand and honors what he told Noah here. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, uh, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea, into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning from every beast. I will require it, I will require it and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. And uh, this is really the first, um, at least post-flood, this is the establishment of a life has value in the eyes of the Lord. And it deserves justice. And it requires the payment for its life. It also says that you can't take the life of a creature and consume its blood. Uh, that there is life in that blood. And that gets into a lot of the um, reasoning behind why atonement works. It also gets into why the enemy wants to take and twist that and subvert it. And why those who worship the enemy want to take this sort of blood reality and use it for rebellious purposes against God and in worship of the enemy. Okay. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made in his own image, or made man in his own image. And you, be fruitful and multiply, team on the earth and multiply in it. And there's the command. It's good to have kids. In fact, it's commanded by the Lord. And, uh, and for those of you who struggle to have kids, we have one kid. We never stop trying. We get one kid. That's what we got. Uh, in your case, maybe you've been blessed to be able to have many, many children. Um, and some of you have chosen not to. And I would just say, if you're choosing not to have kids, just gut check yourself. And realize there is a command, there's a, there's a uh, adamant urging of the Lord to go out, be fruitful, multiply, um, bear that burden of raising kids, but imbue your life that God gave you into others, that they might give it to others and others and others. Um, we are not suffering from overpopulation, no matter what the news says. In fact, we're facing a bit of a population collapse in the world, um, especially out west, countries like Japan, uh, Europe, America. So um, it's, it's good. It's good to have children. The earth can sustain us. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth, with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. There's a promise, again, uh, explained. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Um, and we talked about that, right? Revelation, many judgments. And God said, this is a sign of the covenant, legal promise, legal agreement uh, that I make with you. I shall set a bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. 
God said to Noah, this is, a, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on earth. So it's fascinating, that covenant, and you're like, well, God knows everything. Well, yeah, God knows everything, but he chooses to remember things, right? God knew what every animal was named, but he let Adam name them, right? There are many things which God knows, but he chooses to know anew, afresh. That is, he chooses to experience it. He allows for that in his creation. Um, and, and it's interesting that that covenant, that promise not to judge the world by one massive flood again, is, is not only a promise that he makes by himself. In other words, Noah didn't make this to the Lord. He didn't constrain the Lord into some sort of prayer promise agreement. The Lord made it. The Lord made it. And he made it between himself and, of course, people, but also all of the creatures on the earth. He loves his creation too. And he, even though there will be great judgments on earth, he says that he won't wipe it all out when it comes down to it in the end. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Um, or, you know, another way to read that translated is were populated. So, it really is implying that the whole earth from that point forward was then repopulated through the families of Noah. Okay. The sons of Noah, then Noah began to be a man of the soil and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on their shoulders, and walked backward, covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward. They did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall be he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let them dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Now, this passage in particular has been used to great harm to people groups um, all over Africa. There were uh, a lot of terrible teachings that implied there's somehow a judgment, a racial judgment on the peoples of Africa. But careful study has shown that that's not, one, that's not who the people of Ham descended from, okay? Um, you can go do your own research, but that, that's how I understand it. And, and really, this has also been used to say that this had something to do with um, uh, homosexuality. Now, that may be, but there is a giant gap there of what sin occurred, what sin is said to have occurred is that, well, what sin we might say has occurred is that uh, he looked upon his nakedness. Okay. And as a result, he says that his kids, that's Ham's kids, his line would be impacted by that sin. So we don't necessarily have some some sin of sexual relationship going on that he was somehow taking advantage. You might pull that from later passages, say with the daughters of of um, of uh, 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 Lot, right in the cave. They get their dad drunk. They sleep with him. Um, you have some scenarios later in the Old Testament that might imply that some fishiness was going on and, and could be, but you can't say what that was. At bare minimum, we might imply that it was just merely what seems not such a big deal, especially to those who do, you know, home care and have to take care of family members and see their nakedness or whatever. Um, but at this time, this was a big deal. Like you didn't do this and Ham did. So, <clears throat> These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. 
Um, the sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Teres. Sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Ripoth, Togarah, the sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, Dodam. From these, the coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own language, by their clans and their nations. Sons of Ham, okay, sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, Canaan, sons of Cush, Seba, Havla, Sabata, Rama, Sab, Sabteca, sons of Rama, Sheba, and Denon. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on the earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. And in the midst of this whole genealogy, Nimrod's mentioned, um, his power and greatness has been speculated to be um, also influenced. Uh, this might be some of the first influence that we see uh, as the world's being reestablished. Um by the Nephilim possibly engaging into Nimrod's uh, success um, maybe uh, implies that his rulership is then aided by the enemy who truly does still dwell and rule, you know, title deed of the earth. Um, it's a deeper study, but you can see that Nimrod is different than all of these people, all great leaders and clan leaders and leaders of family lines. Uh, but Nimrod, a great, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Okay. Um, and, you know, I will I will eschew reading the rest of this. But, you know, you're going to see a lot of names in there if you want to read chapter 10. You get all the names of some very familiar families that will pop up throughout the whole of our, New, our Old Testament read-through. So let's go ahead and um, come on down to chapter 11. We'll... We'll close with chapter 11. Familiar story, right? Tower of Babel. So, the whole earth had one language. Makes sense, right? Noah, his kids, kids' wives, uh, his wife, they all spoke the same language. And, um, and as a result, all the tribes of the earth, the various clans that were going out, still spoke the same. Now, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the whole face of the earth. Now, mind you, the command was to be fruitful, multiply, spread out, Fill the earth. And here they were sort of coagulating together, right? And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they purpose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and left and they left all the building of the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth. So God sought to fulfill, help them fulfill the thing that they, he commanded them to do. They're the, they, these are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered a, par, a parashad, and two years after the flood, and Shem lived after he fathered a, posh, a pakashad, 500 years, and had other sons and daughters. When Pakashad had lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah, and a pakashad lived in um, after he fathered Shelah, 403 years, and had other sons and daughters. Shelah lived 30 years. He fathered Eber. Shelah lived and fathered Eber 403 years, had other sons and daughters. Eber had lived 34 years. He fathered Peleg. And Eber 
lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. Uh, Peleg lived 30 years, he fathered Ru, and Peleg lived after he fathered Ru 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Ru had lived 32 years, he fathered Sherug, and Ru lived after he fathered Sarug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sarug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor, and Sarug lived after he fathered Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. And here are some names you'll start to recognize. When Nahor had lived 229 years, he fathered Terah. And Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. <clears throat> when Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. <coughs> Mind you, he named one of his kids after himself. And Abram, Abram is Abraham where we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Now, <clears throat> these are the generations of Terah. Terah fa fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot, who I mentioned earlier. Remember his daughters, we'll read about it. <clears throat> so, so Lot is his nephew, Abraham's nephew. Um, the name of Abram, Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and Iscah. Now, Sarai was barren. She had no child. So this is the start of explaining the miracle that will unfold with giving life where there was no option or, or reasonable possibility for life. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, and his son Abram's, law, Abram's wife, and they were they uh, went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So isn't it interesting? We'll get into the call of Abram tomorrow uh, or next time. You know, it's they were on their way to the promised land. And we don't get a, a, a notion, um, except for this directional move, that Terah took his son, Abram, who will become Abraham, uh, and of course Lot, and uh, to go to Canaan. And, uh, but they stop. They don't go the full distance. Now, we don't know, again, if Terah was told to go but with the call to Abraham, at least we know that God was calling this family that direction. We know that for sure through Abraham, because then we'll eventually get, you know, Isaac and then Jacob, who becomes Israel, and all the tribes of Israel, and then the setting up of everything that we know about the law and then the eventual uh, coming of the Messiah. Um, but Terah. It wasn't Abraham who first set out in that direction. It was actually his dad. So, um, now did Terah fail on his calling? Again, we don't know if he was called. Um, but this godly family was headed that direction. And uh, and God will will read about tomorrow, call Abraham that way. So, it's kind of interesting. When God calls you, you got to go. Got to go. Uh, when God tells you to get out of the ark, it's time to get out of the ark. Can't hole up there. God says, hey, be fruitful, multiply, spread out over the earth. And then you're like, ah, nah, kind of like hanging out with each other. Uh, maybe we'll just build a little town here with a big old temple, big old tower. And God's like, no, it's not what I told you to do. So we have a pattern where even though there are godly people and there's still sinfulness in the world and rebellion, not wanting to abide in what the Lord's telling you else to do. So um, God says, go, got to go. God says, go, got to go. Until uh, next time. Hey, will be day 337. God bless you. Keep walking. Bye-bye.